it's April. And you know what that means, the biggest month for professional wrestling. And I get to talk about it uninterrupted for like an hour. So, what are we talking about today? I can't do the rock eyebrow. Look at this cool setup. I hope you don't mind that I switched the chair and changed the jacket, the famous Natter jacket. Um, it's 99 degrees the day I'm recording this, and we don't have air conditioning. And also, if you see sweat on my brow, keep it to yourself. I love Cartoon Network to death because it's always been behind the two other big children's networks. So they try weirder things, like just throwing stuff at the wall because they have less to lose. Yeah, see, Unreal was bad, but at least it was strange and weird. That's why I think a show like Teen Titans Go is really disappointing. It has nothing to do with the show, you know? It's more about it became so popular that they just stopped trying. I love Cartoon Network and I'm incredibly nostalgic for the 2008 2009 era. It's famously disliked and it's probably just nostalgia blindness, but I don't think this era was that bad. That being said, they definitely made some decisions. You may remember such hits like 2009, the year they decided to not make any more cartoons and just make live action shows. 2008, 2009 era Cartoon Network started to get really into the best way to describe it is thumb based content. October 2nd, 2008. Hardcore fans of the channel will know I've I've talked about this day before. The Cartoon Network had recently gotten the rights to air the new Star Wars animated series, The Clone Wars. That was a big get for them. So they were racking their brains like, oh, how are we gonna promote this new show like Star Wars doesn't already sell itself? So they, and God only knows why, decided to air a straight to DVD bargain bin thumb parody of Star Wars. That was not for children. Cut it down, put a new episode of Flapjack in the middle of it, and aired it on their children's network. This mess was created by Steve Odenkirk, the lesser Odenkirk. You'll remember him from his company, O Entertainment. Their logo appears at the end of Jimmy Neutron episodes right before, Hi, I'm, I'm Paul. Paul. And they made such classics as Thumb Wars, The God Thumb, Bat Thumb, Franken Thumb, Thumb Tannic, The Blair Thumb, Barnyard. Also, the Wikipedia article states, Thumb Wars, The Thighs of Skyskipper is an upcoming spoof of Star Wars Rise of Skywalker releasing possibly during 2022. So look forward to that. This is really good timing on my part. And there's another short titled The Thumbersons that is an exclusive to the PlayStation Portable. As you can imagine with a topic like this, it's filled with hazy childhood memories and undocumented cash out films. So there's bound to be a lot of lost media. I occasionally write some of these videos with the intention of there being a sequel down the line. <laughs> the Xbox. I didn't think Thumbs was going to be one of them, but the fact that I'm like setting out feelers like, oh man, if this stuff ever gets found, we may need an update on this someday. I've done extensive research into schedules to confirm what movies Cartoon Network did and didn't air, and I've come to the conclusion that The God Thumb never aired on Cartoon Network, even though I distinctly remembered watching it. Like, I swear to Christ I've seen it, but I don't know anything about it, so I, I that's probably not true. Let's start this early. Let's just put a counter up here for things I remember but can't prove. One of the nudes era I'm nostalgic for, oh yeah, 2008, 2009, this era was called nudes. Those little white guys run around, they're called nudes, N-O-O-D-S, didn't age very well. The Thursday night block, Har Har Thursdays, made up of mostly new episodes of Chowder, Flapjack, Total Drama, occasionally Johnny Test and 16. Also Goosebumps for a little bit. People didn't have a problem with that live action show. Why am I defending CN Real so? I don't even like it really. But that's what they did for Halloween. It's nice to see blocks like this themed for the holidays. For most of October, it became scare scare scares days but for october 2nd it became star star stars days welcome to star 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 Wars. <laughs> again on the hunt i found footage of this night and thank god because I, I don't think i'd be able to convince you it was real and also it would drive me crazy all the sound effects were switched with star wars sound effects and that's about it. None of the new episodes were even remotely relevant to Star Wars. Like, I don't know what episodes would have been Star Wars themed, but when I think of Star Wars, I think of Lindsay getting eliminated for no reason. But like I said earlier, they did air something Star Wars related. Thumb Wars is a 1999 short film parody of Star Wars, made to piggyback off the upcoming Phantom Menace movie, which uses Synchrovox technology, which was used in old 50s cartoons and popularized by the Annoying Orange, in which human lips are recorded and then placed over animation instead of actually animating them. Also this Spongebob bit. Guys, 
I love this thing. I really thought I was gonna watch a garbage straight to DVD movie and like shit on it. This video would be like, hey, remember when they showed this? Doesn't this thing suck? And I was so caught off guard when I laughed out loud multiple times while watching this. I remember parts of it, but I assumed nothing else and it really had an impact on me because I don't want to admit that Thumb Wars was like an important experience for me as a kid, but the way they talk in this short, that's how I talk. They say dumb things in a very matter of fact way and refuse to break from that vernacular for anything. I've seen a decent amount of parodies. You think it's gonna be full of puns like, oh God, it's the thumb Darth Vader. Let me guess, thumb Vader, Darth Finger. His name is Black Helmet Man. Black Helmet Man. Well, what have we here? Princess Bobhead of the Thumbbellion Resistance. Like, like, that's his legal name. They keep describing things as freaky little creatures, and I just sat there like, huh, I do that. I must admit, the first time I met one of the thumbs, I was horrified. I found them to be freaky, disturbing creatures. They called the Jawas freaky little hooded creatures, and I thought it was just a funny throwaway line, but then they keep calling them that. No, oh, that part will take them straight to the desert, and the freaky little hooded creatures will capture and sell them. Ew, look over there. Some freaky little hooded creatures. I bought a couple of droids today from the freaky little hooded creatures. That's just what they're called in this universe. I also fully expected this to be just like a cheap cash grab because that's what I thought as a kid because it wasn't like super high budget. I mean, how was I supposed to know? I had faith in the children's television network that they wouldn't air someone's random YouTube video on their most important new episode block. But the prop, set, and costume designs are actually fantastic, like unironically. You could tell that a lot of effort went into every little detail of this movie like people legitimately labored over this and i wrote it off just because it's weird i wish i could make something this good crying is for little girls babies and men who just had their ears ripped off like what the fuck why is that so funny i'm the target demographic look i am your mother <laughs> no! <gasps> that man's a girl laugh wait scan back <laughs> What do you see? Oh dear. Ah. <laughs> what? <laughs> beep boop beep. <laughs> How did you ever get such a name? <laughs> I was seven when I saw this. In the Adult Swim video, I did talk about this night. The details I mentioned were that I saw it on TV and I loved it so much that I looked it up on the internet after and my sister also remembers watching it on the computer with me so I know that this happened. And I also said that I remembered both of us watching it again on Adult Swim. The version that aired on TV for Cartoon Network was cut down, not only for length, but you know, remove the weird stuff. But they only aired it like twice, back to back on completely different times. And it's so weird and surreal. How do they expect kids to not look it up? What would you think? It? The version on YouTube is the complete uncut, uncensored version. The one I watched for this video is a 4K remastered upload from 2020. So shout out to Aaron Brennan. No idea why you did this, but thanks. So the pipeline existed anyway. Kids were going to look this up. And by kids, I mean me. They cut out the upskirt and the droid sex, but there's one bit. All right, if you're going, we must do this correctly. Touch your tongue to mine. What? Your tongue, touch it to mine. Why? To make it all official. T to make what official? <sighs> You know, all of it. Which they couldn't cut out because it's a reoccurring bit that comes back later and it would have like thrown the plot all around. So they're like, all right, keep it. I feel in my spirit that I am to train under you so I too can be a thumb master. Train you, will I? Train you, I will. Yes. Step one, touch your tongue to mine. So yeah, they had... Oh my god, that that's the Yoda puppet. I kind of skimmed over this in multiple different videos, but I've brought it up multiple times. The story I remember is that me and my little sister were both in my room late at night watching Adult Swim and they aired Thumb Wars again and they showed the Yoda puppet and it freaked both of us out and scarred us for life. I thought I made that up. The Yoda puppet, I thought I was misremembering. I could never find proof. There it is. 
He actually exists. Th I'm sorry. I find this cool. If you don't, fuck you. That is mean. Like I said earlier, I did extensive research for this video. I made a chart that I can't show you because it gives away the rest of the video. Thumb Wars aired on Cartoon Network twice, a couple days after each other, but never aired on Adult Swim. That part I got wrong. So with knowing what I know now, I think what actually happened is I watched it the first time on Cartoon Network, and then I recognized that the Yoda puppet would definitely scare the shit out of my baby sister because she's terrified of puppets. So I needed to show it to her. It wasn't in my bedroom like I thought, but I also thought it was Adult Swim, and nighttime when you're a kid is like 8 p.m. So it's possible I just watched it on the Har Har Thursdays night, and it was like, you know, late for a kid, and I just assumed it was Adult Swim or misremembered it. And we both remember watching it on the family computer. I just remembered it happening three times, but I guess it only happened twice. I knew the Yoda Pub was coming because it scared me, so I brought my baby sister down. I'm like, hey, you gotta see this. Showed her the Yoda Puppet. And it went smoothly. Plan went off without a hitch. She was terrified. I was laughing. Thumb Wars did air again on Cartoon Network on October 4th, 2008 at 8.30 a.m. The day after Clone Wars had already premiered. And I don't think I watched it. You know, 8.30 a.m. Then it was never seen again. It does link up pretty well with the timeline that that Yoda puppet at the very beginning of October scared the shit out of us. Because the rest of October 2008... It's about to get a whole lot worse. If you don't believe in ghosts. If you don't mind, dummies. If you think nothing scares you. Then think again. Really hard. Goosebumps, the live action TV series had come to Cartoon Network from 2007 to 2009 every October. And no one had a problem with it at the time because everybody loves Goosebumps. And out of Jimmy's head had already come out and people were like, oh, this sucks. And oh boy, maybe someday I'll talk more in depth about childhood trauma and, and Goosebumps I watched. But um, oh, little boy me watching this dropped his drawers and shat his britches. Ooh, no, bad lines. Out of fear, not out of like arousal. I was scared. And then the Thursday after Star Star Stars Days, it became Scare Scare Scares Days. Said that earlier. This gimmick made more thematic sense with the new episodes coming out at the time. Psycho Killer with a hook adds up. Over the next three weeks, they replaced new episodes of Chowder and Flapjack with. Uh, Night of Living Tower 3, I don't think that's right, The Ghost Next Door, and Welcome to Dead House, Goosebumps movies, while keeping spooky-themed Johnny Test and Total Drama episodes. Also, the Cartoon Network premiere of 16, with its Halloween episode. So a bunch of people's first exposure to 16 was the non-canon episode where all the characters die. That was not the first episode. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, on October 16th, 2008. They needed to fill 30 minutes before 16. So guess what they aired? I thought the title card said this was directed by David Bowie. Okay. This one wasn't nearly as good. Eeny, meeny, miny, mosey. Oh! If he hollers, put him in a bucket, saddle up the horses and move to Dan Tuckett. Maybe I shouldn't have expected it to be an in-depth parody of the actual original story. He's got Igor and Lightning. What was I thinking? Maybe it just seems worse because I've seen so many Star Wars parodies and they're all so generic and boring. So the thumb one really stood out by being interesting and funny and this Frankenthumb, like it's an average Frankenstein parody. He's not even green. It's got a good atmosphere. Like the sets are still clearly labored over. I don't know if I watched this one October night in my room right after Goosebumps, I'd, I'd probably enjoy it a little bit. I'm a big atmosphere guy. It's even got the Goosebump green goo letters. Not a lot of it was funny. I do really like this part. But I gave it life. Take it back. Kill it. Kill it now. Perhaps you're right. I mean... Perhaps he'd be better off, you know, but who should do it? I'll do it! Give me a hammer, I'll kill him! Anything matter-of-fact I love. Why beat around the bush? I'm gonna beat it to death. I saw it do it with my own eyes! Uh, we should kill it! I wish I had literally anything else to say about this. I was hoping if it wasn't funny, it would be fully bad and at least entertainingly bad so I can talk about. But no. 
middle of the road, pretty generic. Um, I don't regret watching it because this one line makes the whole thing worth it. They light up when you light them. They're sticks when you don't. I do not sell lighters as my family was killed in a bad fire accident. I see potential in this. More of this, please. I'm so disappointed in you. Freaking no. I was laughing. I wasn't crying on the verge of tears because of how disappointed I was. All right, I don't know. Up to interpretation. Death of the author. I know the plot is inconsequential to these shorts, specifically in Thumb Wars, where they're just like, ah, who fuck? Whatever. She escaped somehow. But the end of this one, to save Frank at them from the angry mob, the doctor and his freaky little hooded creature makes a new monster, Franken Bat Thumb, who saves the day. Wow, what a random non sequitur uh, cutaway that has no relevance whatsoever and won't come back. It's just a standalone joke. Cool, no more of that. Definitely not a harbinger of things to come. <laughs> I laughed because I said, come. It aired again, like Thumb Wars, at 8.30 a.m. on October 25th, right before the Dynamite Action Squad. Now let's talk about that. The Dynamite Action Squad was a Saturday morning action block that was all about action and epicness, you know, boy stuff. It was a holdover from the fall era that bled into the nudes era. It's consisted of your average boy stuff, you know, Pokemon, Bakugan, Yu-Gi-Oh, Transformers, anything really used to sell toys to children. That doesn't mean I didn't love it at the time though. I held together my Bakugan with scotch tape because I broke them. Thumb Wars and Frankathum had more than worn out their welcome by this point. In two airings? Damn. But Cartoon Network still needed its thumbs. For some reason. It still never... I don't know. They had been getting all these thumb fills from one distributor, one team. You know, they had the monopoly of thumb movies. If they didn't want to work with them, what were they going to do? Find a different team making a different thumb-based property? What are the odds of that? The action block sought out to do two things. Have action and sell toys. The thumbs were just a bonus, I guess. <laughs> Here it is. The reason you're here probably. The TWF or Thumb Wrestling Federation is a parody wrestling show based around thumb wrestling. You get it? Thumb wrestling? Thumb wrestling. It was originally released in 2006 on the Kids WB and Nicktoons, but it's most remembered for Cartoon Network because of how tied in it was. We're gonna get more into it later, but it wasn't just episodes airing. It was bumpers, commercials, IDs, indents. They were everywhere. Unlike television episodes or movies on DVDs, bumpers in between commercials aren't archived nearly as well, if at, at all. That's why most of the lost media surrounding kids' networks is little bumpers or blocks. These little thumb guys were all over the network for a year, and I can't prove it. Like, there's archived posts on forums, but no, I need hard evidence. So just know that a lot of what I'm going to talk about is lost media, but I'm not coming in empty-handed. I'm about to show you all the TWF footage I found tied to the Dynamite Action Squad. Check it out. Stick around for a new episode of 16! I'm so excited! That, that's it? You were gone for like 15 seconds. Each TWF episode is about three minutes, which is not enough to fill a television slot unless you put a bunch of them back to back, but that's probably too much for a person. If you want to get people sick of it fast, that's one way of doing it. So instead, in between the new anime episodes, once a weekday, you would see a new fight. The Saturday Morning Wars could really be its own video and it'd be like multiple hours because the history of each children's network trying to get the Saturday Morning audience, they went through each other's throats. The goal was to get as many children watching you on the Saturday morning as possible. And I mean, this worked like a charm. I recorded a lot of TV as a kid. It's a shame I don't have the recordings anymore, but I still made sure to tune in every time there was a fight because I didn't want to miss it. Little did I know the entire series had already been released on DVD at this time and was probably posted on YouTube so I could have watched it. But wait, Andrew, you just talked about Saturday morning, but you said previously that the fights would air every weekday. What? While it's true that one fight, one episode, could not fill enough TV time, if you missed any of the fights in the prior week on Saturday, at the very end of the block, they would do the TWF weekly recap to basically run down what happened the five week 
days. The Monday to Friday block was called the Thumbtastic After School event that would air, you know, after school when kids are getting home. And then Saturday they would do the recap. So Sunday was the only day you could feasibly escape these thumbs. You would get off the school bus and run home and watch the cool thumb show. And yeah, you would miss the new episode of Chalk Socky Chooks, but nobody likes that show. Also the new 16, if that's important to you, they would recap the five previous fights over the five previous days. Again, most of this, and by most of it, I mean, I haven't found any of it, but I, I don't know what's out there, is completely lost. And the forms and schedules I looked at and cross-referenced say that it aired, but it doesn't say which matches happen on which days. So I'm just gonna assume they aired season one in order. By the way, there's five seasons of this show. It was big, which is why it's weird that I don't see more people talking about it. Like it was a phenomenon for like a while. I remember at the Scholastic Book Fair, nobody wanted to get books, so they would always get toys or books that were tied to toys. And my one friend spent all the money getting this TWF book that came with a ring and the little things you could actually thumb wrestle. I got erasers and like ate them or something or stuff on my nose, I don't know. I couldn't get the toys. All I did was go to cartoonnetwork.com and play the Flash games, one of which is like, oh, the fighting game, but it's just rock, paper, scissors. And I used the OC maker to make my own thumb wrestlers and then printed out hundreds of them at my grandparents house till they ran out of paper that similar story keeps coming up a lot in my childhood. I printed a lot of things. I was at the Gummy Bear friend's house, watch Adult Swim video for context. We were looking at pictures of Itsy Bitsy, the spider thumb character on Google Images. I don't remember why. And I accidentally, instead of copying the image, saved the image to the background and then we would close the tab. I got jump scared because of how low quality it was. It was like a 240p image. It was completely pixelated and I'm like, oh, I jump scared myself. What was I talking about? So the schedule, if what I put together is correct, is weekly recap, weekly recap, weekly bat thumb. Oh no, I spoiled bat thumb. You guys all knew bat thumb was coming. Come on, don't lie. Please do not lie. Going off this assumption of that's what they aired, I'm just gonna watch all of season one of TWF and if anything changes moving forward, I'll say it couldn't find anything else. Let's get into it. Each episode kicks off with commentary by Dick Thompson, the straight down the middle voice of TWF and Colonel Kolsak, an amalgamation of Mother Russia mid 2000s memes and right now is worst time to be talking about Russia. Hometown Huck is a poster thumb for the next eras. Good luck, Hometown Huck. He reminds me of my old friend, Hometown Vladimir. And they must think this guy's really funny because they keep using him to make like family guy style cutaway gags. The littlest big show on earth. You mean Vladivostok flea suckers? Never have I seen such large fleas! Colonel, I'm talking about the Thumb Wrestling Federation. The ringleader flea is particularly enormous! Answer me! Ah, he must have beaten many dogs! Rounding up, each episode is four minutes long. And they have cutaway gags. Speaking of Mother Russia, I don't mean to start a heated argument or debate about uh, the Thumb Wrestling Federation, but I never really noticed as a kid how many of these characters are just stereotypes. When I start this, my loving fans. Are you ready to play with fire? Yeah! She's full of grace and in your yeah! face. Wasabi! Remembering yeah! Wallabies, Gary's using the Australian kangaroo pouch combo. Go ahead, partner, crush me. On my honor, a gentleman never attacks without being attacked first. Well, us country boys don't shoot till we see the whites of your eyes, so I ain't making the first move. Just like real wrestling. Similar to how real wrestling has baby faces, good guys, and heels, bad guys, the TWF has Sinistras and Dexteras. The logos are evidently based off the Decepticons and Autobots from Transformers. And it makes sense to have a good team and a bad team so that each match can have a good guy and a bad guy, which is pretty intrinsic to wrestling. However, not all characters are created equal. You get good guy characters such as Vinny Vinny Victory, the charismatic cool guy from Boston who wins all the time. That's his gimmick. He wins all the time. It's John Cena. Hometown Huck, who is the generic hometown hero to every town in existence. Ouch, who is the scam guy from that chocolate episode of Spongebob. Ouch. I think I just swallowed my tongue. Ah, oh, I just swallowed my tongue ring. Evil Ira, who is a cool design, but isn't actually evil. He just does magic, I guess. And Dorsal Flynn, a comedian who is based off of- Holy me, my name I see. Oh, oh, I get more laughs inside a shark's stomach, see? Huh? Sharks can't laugh, get it? How could something that came out when I was a kid age so poorly. Also, you get villains like Senator Skull, the main mustache twirling villain. The Big Time, a guy so cool that the fans cheer him despite being aligned with evil for some reason. And Fuego, the only reason I know what fire in Spanish is. And The Visitor, my favorite character as a kid. 
I think he sucks now. Each character has a signature move that normally transitions into the finish of the match in the end of the episode, but they don't call them finishers. Okay. Sometimes they don't even wrestle. The TWF wants to have both wrestling of good guys versus bad guys and have tournament rules. So they, because they constantly need good guys versus bad guys, every other match, if a good guy won the last one, then a bad guy's gonna win this one. Bad guys have to keep winning as consistently as the good guys, even if they cheat. Imagine if in the 80s Transformers show, every couple episodes, the Decepticons won, and they're just like, oh, they uh, they killed Bumblebee this episode, sorry. The most realistic professional wrestling thing in the show is how many jobbers they have. Enhancement talent that gets fed to the main characters so the main characters don't have to lose. I feel like I need to keep reminding you guys that this show was made in the late 2000s because it's made of 80s wrestling tropes and like 80s Transformers, and one of the villains is just like a He-Man villain. Their knowledge of wrestling does not extend past the 80s, which to be fair is where most people's wrestling knowledge is. It's very clear from the beginning of the show that the budget of this one is nowhere near the thumb movies. And I don't mean literal budget, I'm sure they made more money in the long run. I mean like production value. The production value, well, I can't imagine anyone expected the show to be popular. Is it only season one? I didn't watch much farther, so maybe it gets a little grander, but I doubt it. The reason I had this video idea was just so I can like talk about this weird thing that happened in my childhood, and it was all encompassing, but it seems like not a lot of people remember it, and I just need to get these memories out on the paper. But then I had to think about the marketability of this video, and I'm like, oh, well, me talking about a childhood thing isn't marketable. What is? Oh, talking about movies that suck. Oh, this movie fucking sucks, dude. It blows. I thought I was gonna make fun of them, but then the thumb movies blew my expectations out of the water so hard. It blew the entire video wildly off course, because then I was like, oh, people actually put effort into this. This is actually good. And it put the expectations way too high for TWF, because I'm like, oh, well, I remember that being good, and this thing I remember being bad. The bad thing is good, so the good thing must be great. But then I started the TWF and it's not nearly as good. As a kid, I assumed the movies and the show were related because again, what are the odds there's two separate teams making thumb shows? But it's completely different teams, completely different people, completely different productions. As a kid, I loved the TWF and dreaded the thumb movies, but as an adult, I like the thumb movies and I think the TWF sucks. I think Coolsville sucks. The only thing I remember is four, three, two, one, who will be the strongest thumb? And boy, did I remember it. And I'm not even here to be like, oh, the thing you liked as a kid is secretly bad because nobody cares about the TWF in 2022 and I think kids media can be better than most adult shows but this show reeks of what boys like there's snot there's puke they fart they yell I just wanted to talk about weird thumbs and kind of shit on them but then the thumb movies knock me in the fucking head they're like hey they put my expectations way too high I should rewatch back at the barnyard I looked at the DVD menu and the Wikipedia page to confirm what was happening I watched season one but around episode 17 which is like halfway through the season one it becomes the thumber summer event and like everything changes hopefully you're seeing this the thumb schedule i set up doing the math of okay each five weekday the 17th episode is where it ends off before bat thumb anyway so that's where i was going to end off but that's when like a big change happens so i assume that's post bat thumb but if i'm going to review the first batch i watched nothing happened like it's a tournament rule and so they need to get the good matches for later in the tournament but because of that each character needs to fight a jobber that has nothing to the plot so each match is predictable not that i'm like oh man the integrity of the twf like i know the winning doesn't really matter uh it's about comedy but it's also not funny i don't have a lot of memories i just remember it being good under the umbrella of liking it so maybe all the episodes i remembered fondly are under the next batch because the first batch just Sucks. So we can watch the second batch. But first... Thumb Wars aired twice because Clone Wars have been added to the network. Frank and Thumb aired twice because it was hot. cultural zeitgeist of Batman changes every couple of years every time we get a new Batman movie so you can see a parody of Batman and tell which Batman they're parodying like which one came out that era without even knowing the time period this short film was made way before the Christian Bale Batman uh but the Bruce Wayne in this does like a perfect American Psycho impression Bruce I must say you have outdone yourself this time thank you this champagne is just heavenly. <laughs> You'll have to excuse me. 
<laughs> like that's crazy. How could they have known? All right, this one isn't as funny as it is uncomfortable. I do think it's intentional though. Uh, you're a little close. Oh, sorry. <sighs> you're closer now. I'm... <sighs> oh. It just fails to land properly. And hey, if you're wondering if this one also has weird sex stuff. Morning. I'd like to make a deposit. <gasps> um, money. I'd like to deposit money. Ah! I'd like. I'd like to deposit money in your bank. There's a big portion of the opening made up of these two having sex. Uh, they don't show it. Of course they don't show Yeah, no, sorry. This short film has full frontal thumb nudity and penetration. It's all implied, but I don't remember this part at all. To be fair, I don't remember a lot of bat thumb, but I'm fairly certain they cut this part out of the airing. But it's like a substantial amount of time. Like it's most of the opening. There's a bank robbing scene and the main villain of the piece is shown only from behind. And I'm like, oh, okay, it's gonna be like a joker pun or whatever. What's the thumb pun for this one? And then the longer he kept his back to the camera, I realized. I did actually remember one thing from Batham. No face. Come to the station, no face. It's over for you. Oh, he has no face. This is ingenious because not only is it a funny joke on Two-Face, like, oh, he's got no face, but they save on budget because they don't need to do the thing to his face where they put lips over it. It could just be a thumb. Great idea and funny. The fact that they cut corners with this and also his big scheme is to remove everyone's faces is way funnier than anything in the actual film. I remembered him existing. I remembered the pun. I didn't remember him having the voice of Carl Weezer. For me, it is a sentence to grow up being laughed at. Cruelly teased. I, no face, ask you to welcome me and my new bride to be. <laughs> O Entertainment also made Jimmy Neutron. I already said that. Why bring it up then, man? I should proofread these. The no face gimmick is funny, but I still wouldn't call it lazy. None of this is lazy. They all have fantastic designs, but of the three thumb movies I saw, this one definitely has the most like sloppy animation. They just kind of throw stuff around. The sets are good though. It's probably just more buried nostalgia, but this morning establishing shot before they go in the bank just gives me like an intense sense of like coziness there is cg use and it's definitely noticeable but remember this had no budget it was made in 2001 this is pretty good looking for that time no wonder they went on to do jimmy neutron after this stop bringing up jimmy neutron how many times do am i trying to hit a quota before they were released on tv they were all released together in a collection i think so they cross-reference a lot see look he's got a thumb saver from thumb wars we're free <sighs> come blue jay come tuesday i wish i had more to say about this it's not, none of the thumb movies were bad. It's just kind of boring. Not a lot happens in it. Good everything else that isn't writing. All right, let's move on to the next 15 matches of the TWF. Real quick though, I made this schedule using multiple different sources. Five episodes in the weekday, each being about three minutes, being wrapped up on Saturday, fills the 15 minute time period, even though the TWF episode recap uh, is 30 minutes based on the schedule. I promise this isn't from like a lack of research. I looked really far into this, but a lot of it is just legitimately lost. I, I don't have the details. We don't know what those other 50 minutes were. Imagine watching this for a half an hour. I don't need to. I watched it for more. But November 10th doesn't have an after school event, and then the fourth week gets cut off by Bat Thumb, and then the next week starts without a previous recap. If I had a time machine, I wouldn't go back and stop 9 11. I would just watch TV with Kid Me and figure out what was going on. Scholars refer to this time period as post Bat Thumb. The three weeks PBT all have five weekday episodes and then the wrap up at the end. Luckily, I found footage of one of those days. Unluckily, it's the footage I showed earlier. That was all of it. It's more interesting to talk about than it is to actually watch, you know, roast into glasses, but fine. Enough stalling, 15 TWF matches, round two. I am so confused. So the summer event is the quarterfinals as stated by the commentary and hosts. Every match, even in the previous batch, follows the same formula. There's three rounds, nothing happens in the first two, and then actual stuff happens in the final round. I think they think it's boxing. I thought Vinny Vinny Victory was gonna get to the end because he's the show's mascot basically. But then in the first episode of the new batch, he gets his pockets run by the big time. 
This is getting interesting. But again, because it's tournament rules, good guys have to face bad guys, so it's always alternating who wins. If a good guy won the previous episode, a bad guy's about to win this one, and vice versa. Talk about your 50-50 booking. I don't know who this video is for, because if you're a wrestling fan watching this, you would get all the inside jokes, but if you're not, I mean, why would you watch, if you were a wrestling fan, why would you watch the thumb video? Like I said previously, it's not really about like, oh man, this is important, I need to watch. It's about the jokes. Who wins isn't as important as how they win. A lot of the times there's gimmicks, but more often than not, they just use their signature. Like when I said it wasn't funny, I wasn't being mean like, oh, they're trying so hard to be funny and it's failing. I just mean like they're not making jokes. Like it's not funny because they're not trying to be. I guess you're supposed to be legitimately invested in which character is going to win each day. Like I was as a kid. I guess that's more why I'm being uncompromised and ruthless to this because like it's not like just a random thing I'm watching. It's something I liked as a kid like a lot. So when I'm making fun of it, I'm not trying to make fun of the show. I'm making fun of little kid me who thought this was the coolest thing ever. The one big event that happens in the quarterfinals is the fan favorite bad guy big time actually turns face and joins the good guys. Except he doesn't. He's still a bad guy, but he he turns on one of the bad guys. And then it's not brought up again. But I know that when Kid Me was saw on this, he was losing his shit. Did I not know that real wrestling existed? I wasn't watching it at this time. I guess I did, because I just thought the video game was the video game. You know what? The opening, I did like a bit like, oh, let's talk about real wrestling. I love professional wrestling. And then talked about Thumb Wars, and that's the joke. But if I'm looking at, I didn't even think about this. TWF is probably what got me into professional wrestling, aside from the video games. Because that happened way sooner to me actually watching than playing the games. Holy shit. I was even more surprised the second time around, because I had set the bar so low again. It didn't occur to me while watching that any of these characters could have depth if you want to call this depth. And it would have stood out more had Evil Ira not also turned to the other side the next match by dropping a piano on Enfuego's head. Classic double turn. So now we're in the quarterfinals, the final four, and it's starting to get really interesting. If you're me and Seven. It isn't clear if the big time is actually good. He just won it out of the evil team and the fans still love him. But again, not really brought up after this. Evil Ira, on the other hand, has finally lived up to his name and cheated to advance to the semifinals. Boyhood Dream Hometown Hawk is still unwaveringly good and continues to connect with the fans. And Wasabi sucks. They make a big deal about Evil Ira now being evil because she cheated to win, even though Wasabi does the same thing. The big time interferes and turns on Senator Skull. We knew that, but he cheated and wasabi wit like he's the reason wasabi wins she didn't win fairly either and you could say well andrew he was evil it doesn't count if you're cheating to be evil but en fuego is a bad guy justice for evil ira okay all right now i'm getting heated about this the semifinals kick off with hometown hook versus evil ira and this episode is about six minutes long and they're only going to get longer this is because it kicks off with an evil ira press conference where he states his new home is with the sinistras well there goes all the intrigue in this match. And then he just loses. You hate Omaha! I hate... Uh... No, Hawk! You don't hate Omaha! You're being hypnotized! Whoa! Hypnotized? I love Omaha! Next match, Big Time versus Wasabi. Has the same story, except with more depth. He's still technically a Sinistra, even though he turned on Senator Skull, who is still cheering for him at the beginning because, uh, who cares? No one's watching the show. It's not like some adult is going to come back and watch this and review it in 14 years time. In retrospect, they didn't need to turn evil Ira. I thought it was like, oh, okay, there's too many good guys, so they need to make one of the good guys bad. But he turned bad by beating a bad guy. Like, they could have just had Enfuego win. I like this episode because the big time beats Wasabi. I hate Wasabi. It's the second to last episode. It's mainly just here to set up the finale. There's a crowd member named Pinky who keeps interfering on behalf of the good guys, but it doesn't count with their good guys. And he announced his feelings for Wasabi and she reciprocated. Big Time made fun of him the whole match and then killed his new girlfriend. The finale is 10 minutes long. And I would almost be okay with it because it's the finale if a majority of the time wasn't taken up by Bill Cosby thumb, also Pinky. The episode I'm watching from the DVD, a decent amount of it is just a recap and while it is lost, I wouldn't be surprised if the weekly recap each Saturday was just footage from this specific episode. They didn't produce the show, so it makes more sense for Cartoon Network to just reuse this footage. That's what they did for Total Drama. Hometown Huck comes out the winner with the help of Pinky. 
the crowd member. So I guess we're all good with cheating, huh? This is how Huck became my favorite thumb wrestler. The way he just took big time strongest attack and then gave it everything he had left was nothing short of amazing. This was my favorite match, lol. Hometown Huck surviving the time bond still blows my mind. This was an awesome match. The second in commands on both sides going at each other was quite amusing. These comments were made recently. I feel like I'm missing something. The only thing more fun than wrestling is math. Let's do some math, shall we? At this point, I have no idea what I'm supposed to be watching. If each Thumbtastic After School event is the same length of three minutes, some of these episodes aren't three minutes, so do they get cut into two in multiple days or do they get shortened down? And what about the 10 minute one? If I split these into two, I have six more matches to watch. If I don't, I have nine more matches to watch. The first nine consist of all the first round matches and something called the Royal Thumble, which I am excited for. I need to stop getting my own hopes up. I know what's gonna happen. Watching nine episodes makes more sense because it ending with the Royal Thumble, you know, adds up so i'll just file this under unproven i do honestly hope some of this gets found someday i know i don't have huge reach but if this has any impact on anyone and you're watching this right now and you happen to have recordings from this time hit me up or post it somewhere because again they aired the thumb shit all the time every new season we get new characters and you could tell which new characters are their actual new characters um by just looking at them also they're the ones who win. Yet again, the qualifying rounds is made up of the actual characters they like beating filler characters. The first season was filled with jobber filler and this season's no different. The first match consists of new wrestlers Mr. Extremo and Billy Goat Goateski. I'm trying really hard not to say Goatsy. So try and guess which one they want to move on and become popular. Also, Yowie, wowie! New characters like Mahi Mahi Mindy, which I feel has to be offensive somehow. And Rolf the Reaper, which is basically the same design as Senator Skull. I guess they ran out, but he's billed as dangerously depressed. So he's my new favorite. He doesn't win. Feed a jobber to Itsy Bitsy, feed a jobber to Evil Ira, Canadian stereotype, feed a jobber to Enfuego, feed a jobber to wasabi not only did i already dislike wasabi for being a cheater but the character she beats is named Dwayne bramage that's the best name i've ever heard and they use him once he's my new favorite why couldn't he win then Vinny beats a pirate or something hey check this out i can't believe it with the ref out of the picture the cheetah has really cut loose and face off bill has barely escaped i too must escape I must warn the people of Earth of the invaders among us! I'm incredibly fortunate that a lot of the schedules are still very much intact, so it's easy to document, like, and know which things happened and which didn't. The dates where I said there was no Thumbtastic After School event, that's not because I couldn't find it. That just, like, I checked the schedule and it said there was no event. But there's no information that exists about December 19th, 2008, so I'm just going to assume they aired a Thumb Wars match. Again, no proof, but... What's a boy to do? I might make an update even someday down the line if I'm proven wrong. I refuse. I'm never wrong, even when I am wrong. Can we talk about the fumble now? I've been dying to talk about the fumble. Among us! I know I said I didn't want to get my hopes up, but I'm actually really excited. The actual Royal Rumble in WWE is used to have a bunch of characters interact all at once, which will be really good for the TWF because most of them are one note. And when they're relegated to a small section for a couple seconds, they're going to thrive way more. It's time for the wildest match in the world. That's what I get for being excited. I didn't even give them cool names. You're finished. I know every move from A to Z, A. Z? Who the heck is Z? This episode's 11 minutes long, and I thought it would be another big finale or like having all the wrestlers in it. So I was like, okay, yeah, 11 minutes, that makes sense. But most of it is just inconsequential and not related. All four of these wrestlers do not appear in the rest of the tournament. So I guess they were just fighting for the tag division. But then why did all four of them all need to win individually? That's four separate episodes. I've been talking for too long. Hey, you can't oh. stop us from tagging out in the fifth dimension. Oh shit, it's Stardust. We kind of get what I wanted. There's a bunch of characters brawling backstage. Attitude Era style. Now we're getting the real rumble. Hey, here's my review. The good guys win and I wasted 11 minutes. So now I've officially watched all thumb-based content that allegedly aired on Cartoon Network. But there's only three episodes left in season two. I could easily watch them. I won't but I could. Maybe I'm being too hard on the show, but you would think it would at least be a little good considering how popular it was and all encompassing it was. It's kind of like Johnny Test or Teen Titans Go. Like the shows aren't 
terrible, but it's way aggravated because they're on all the time. I'm making assumptions, but I don't think you're fully grasping how big this was for months. Every day except Sunday, there would be TWF content. And from this point on, it only got worse or better, depending on how you look at it. By late December, both the Thumbtastic After School event and Dynamite Action Squad blocks had run their courses and ended. But Cartoon Network refused to go without a Saturday morning action block. So what would it be replaced with? Next Saturday morning at 9.30, part of Saturday Crush Zone, only on Cartoon Network. Saturday Crush Zone. A Saturday morning action block themed entirely around the TWF. You thought we were going to be done with the thumbs, but they've only become more prevalent. You'd think that the time period we just talked about was like really long, you know, Franken-thumb, Thumb Wars, Bat-thumb, two seasons of TWF, but in reality, that all happened in the span of like two months. The TWF Saturday Crush Zone lasted for 10 months. Oh uh, no, this video is gonna be way too long again. Why would I spend so much time talking about two months in depth when I have 10 more months to talk about? Well, and you're gonna be upset about this. Like I said before, and I'll say it again, the TWF series had DVD rips and it was on YouTube and the thumb movies were also on YouTube and had their own DVD release. They are short films and episodes for television. The TWF Crush Zone is themed around the TWF, but only bumpers. Like, it's all over the branding, but that's all it is. It's just branding. It's way harder to cover or archive blocks or bumpers because they never put in the care to properly archive them themselves. Like, maybe only I care about this, but how cool would it be if you can go on Disney Plus and watch, like, the library of all the previous bumpers and commercials they made? Same thing with, like, HBO Max and Cartoon Network. There is still a decent, big, cool internet community, that are all together trying to put these pieces together. And I wouldn't say I'm a part of it, but I've been commenting on everyone's TV rips saying, oh, this is when this happened, this is when this happened, because I figured out all the schedules once and then it's stuck in my brain. So this wall of 10 months of weekly content, uh, I don't really have anything to talk about. Like I know it exists, but the thumb content's just lost. Except October 17th, 2009, the third to last thumb themed broadcast on the network. I found some footage. Welcome back to this new episode of Pokemon Diamond and Pearl! Oh boy! This new episode of Pokemon Diamond and Pearl will be right back! I will go on hunger strike until show returns! Good luck, Colonel! Ah, I can't wait any longer! Um... Welcome back to this new episode of Pokemon Diamond and Pearl! Hey! I saw Puny Whip change channel during last break! Calm down, Colonel! Come forth and face me, Channel Changer! I mean, yeah, that's it, but how cool is that that we found it? To that one kid from 2009 that decided to record the new Pokemon episode and upload it, I thank you. But you see what I mean now, I thank god I had the evidence. It's mostly just snippets in between episodes. I mean, what's there to talk about? I gotta say though, I've been taking it for granted. When I was watching season one, I was just sitting there thinking, oh my god, when is this gonna be over? I don't wanna watch TWF anymore. But now that I can't watch the Saturday Crush Zone, and I may never be able to, it bums me out. I would gladly watch more TWF if I could just watch the lost media. And that's really what this whole video is. I've struggled the whole time to find a point, like whether I was gonna review them, talk about them, but it's a retrospective. In reality, I just wanted to talk about these memories. I needed to make this public and tell my story so that other kids my age could also potentially share stories. I'm making it sound like there's like an abuser going around. October, 2009. Saturday morning block had already ended, but Scare Scare Scares Days had come around again for the final year. No goosebumps this time, but Halloween themed new episodes. By November 2009, Scare Scare Scares Days ended, we would never see another holiday themed Har Har Thars Days again, and we would never see any more thumb content again. In the middle of the Crush Zone run, Cartoon Network premiered CN Real, a block made up of strictly live action shows. And you could say that the thumb movies helped that happen. Goosebumps too. That could also be its own video. They didn't produce anything other than the live action shows this year. The Billy and Mandy spinoff was canned and things were looking bleak. Even before then, the writing for CN was pretty much on the wall. Most of the shows premiering in the last couple years were either imports from Canada, imports from Japan, or shows that they didn't make. You know, like Thumbs, for example. I'm really nostalgic for this era because, you know, I was a kid and it's probably about as far back as I can remember TV-wise. So it means a lot to me personally, 
but I understand why people don't look back fondly on this era. Like I said before, Cartoon Network was always behind the main two, but only like a little bit behind. And it was fun to watch them do risky stuff because they were the least popular, but I never wanted them to go out of business. Like unpopular is cool, but not like under the water unpopular. Har Har Thursdays ends April 1st, 2010, and along with it, the nudes. End of an era. I don't know how they're gonna recover from this. I just hope whatever the next era is, they do a little better. What time is it? What time is it? What time is it? What time is it? And then after the nudes ended, in the span of three years, they premiered Regular Show, Adventure Time, Gumball, Steven Universe, and new season of Total Drama. It was a far cry from the thumbs of yore, but it was undoubtedly better. So yeah, that's it. Just wanted to talk about thumbs. It's cool the way it works out schedule-wise is that it started like the first thumb premiere happened October 2008 and the final thumb premiere happened October 2009. For an entire year, Cartoon Network aired thumb-based content. And I don't know, people have talked about it, but an entire year. It seemed weird. I was nostalgic watching some old commercials because I did the um, April Fool's broadcast. And I was like, okay, well, I might as well do this. If you came here because you wanted more Xbox content, <laughs> oh, whoops, you got the thumbs. Ah!